Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis. And my guest today is our local member of parliament for Thunder Bay Superior North. Is it Superior North? It is. It is. And also the minister in the present government of Labor, uh, Employment and Workforce Development. Right. I got that right. You, you did. Now, almost. Yeah. Is, there, is there a normal no. o order that it's supposed to be set it's in? It's uh, uh, Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Labor. But I saw that on the, the website. You're not the only one that fixes <laughs> all those words up. <laughs> well, welcome back, pa Patty. We've, you've, we've had you on the show a number of times. And we had you in the first year when you were elected as a federal member and you were a member, the, uh, a member of the cabinet then mm -hmm. um, uh, in charge of uh, the status of women. Mm -hmm. So it's now been a little over three years. You're now like a veteran. Huh. Well, I, I'm a three-year-old for sure. As a <laughs> a three-year-old veteran. <laughs> three-year-old veteran, yeah. So what's changed? What's changed for you in the last three years? Oh, a whole bunch of things have changed for me. I mean, first of all, my understanding of how the system works and government works and politics works and how all of that fits together, uh, both on a local level as a member of parliament, but also as a cabinet minister, I have a much better understanding of how all of that works and how you get projects from start to finish or how you can best be an advocate, for example, for your regions or your communities. Um, I think I have more confidence in uh, my abilities as a speaker and as someone who can go out and represent our region and represent our country in some cases I've been able to do that. Yeah, you've been on the international stage at times. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm more comfortable in my own skin. I think I'm starting to realize that, uh, you know, when you start with, uh, first of all, of course, you have to win an election and an election is a popularity contest to a certain degree. And so, you know, the desire to want to be liked by everybody is uh, profound as for politicians. And some of us never grow out of that. Of course, I want as many people to be happy with what I'm doing or what we're doing as a government as possible. But I have come to the realization that when you make decisions, sometimes people are not happy with that decision. And, um, and I'm comfortable with that level of, of conversation now. You know, I can meet with people that are profoundly different than I am or that see things differently and I um, I don't feel compelled to convince them that my way of looking at things is the right way. I really want to hear why they're concerned about the decisions that we've taken. Look for opportunities to bring that message back or to change course in the way that we make decisions or reflect on that feedback um, and understand that sometimes you have to walk away from those discussions too and realize that you know there just isn't any possible way of making everybody happy and that takes time. For, for me, it took time to get to that level of comfort with, I guess, discord or with, uh, with, uh, with conflict, really. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> so now you mentioned you've learned a little bit more about how to get results, how to, how to move a project along. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's one of your priorities that you're working on? You can give us a little bit more insight in how that works. Well, federally, for example, we've been able just in the last month to introduce proactive pay equity legislation, something that many different groups have been calling for, including women, but also union groups and many different progressive groups. For what, 50 years? How long has it been? Well, or it's, longer? it's 150 <laughs> years since Confederation, <laughs> so I would imagine women would have liked to be paid equally for work of equal value since then, but certainly it's a conversation for at least the 50, 50 years and... and, and and in the last 10, a really loud conversation. And uh, so we were able to introduce legislation in the last Budget Implementation Act just recently uh, that will mean that employers, federally regulated employers, will have an obligation to have a pay equity plan that they'll submit to the federal government and then and an obligation to make adjustments to salaries based on any adjustments that are required. And so this is a big win for many advocates and activists over the years and something I'm really proud to have been the minister that's introduced. Also, I've been working on modern labor standards. Uh, so this is uh, essentially updating the Canada Labor Code. We talked about this the last time I was yeah. there. Uh, so that was also in this piece of legislation that will mandate things like um, five leave days, three of them will be paid personal leave days. So people who are sick or have crisis in their life or what have you, whatever reason, will be able to take time away from work to deal with that. Um, you know, there'll be better break provisions, better uh, scheduling provisions, and we'll be finally able to deal with some of the most uh, egregious um, aspects of contract flipping in the airline sector, something that doesn't affect a lot of people, but for those that it affects, really is quite profound. And so, so let's let, hang on there because I want to explore both of those a little bit more, but let's go back to the pay equity. Mm -hmm. So. We've been working on this for many, many years. 
So how were you able to move that forward? You know, what did you learn that, that, that you got success on that file? Well, I think it starts with the Prime Minister, quite frankly. This is a Prime Minister that's been talking about the uh, success of women, about having uh, a feminist government, and what that means is a country where everybody sees the same opportunity to succeed. And what I realized as Minister of Status of Women very quickly was that if we were going to actually achieve any measure on any kind of targets that we had set for ourselves, we were going to have to talk about the economic prosperity of women. And in order to do that, we had to deal with pay inequities that were existing in the areas and sectors that we controlled, which are the federally regulated private and public sectors. People don't understand what pay equity is, and they think that it means that a man and a woman doing exactly the same job should get the same amount of pay, and they'll say, doesn't that already exist? And that does already exist in most sectors. If you're a data input clerk and you work next to a data input clerk with the same amount of time and, and seniority, you will likely be on a pay grid and get the same amount of pay. So that's not what it is. What it is is saying work that's typically valued as female, let's say a data entry clerk, should be paid the same as work that's valued as male or typically considered male, let's say a mm -hmm. tech assistant. Maybe they have the same level of responsibilities, the same level of skills that they're needed, uh, the same levels of autonomy and decision making, but because one has been designated a female job, because typically female do it, or there's always been females doing it, it often will see, receive lower pay than the one that is exactly the same level of skills and experience that is considered male. And that's what pay equity sets about to fix, is to assess each job classification and make sure that we're not penalizing women's work. And so that's, I think, what's most exciting for me about pay equity is it starts that conversation about how we value what we typically consider women's work. So, Patty, we're talking about really the federally regulated sector. You're talking about both employment, equ um, uh, pay, equity. pay equity, and then also looking at labor standards. Mm -hmm. So how does that break down in the workforce, the federal and provincial jurisdictions? So federally regulated sectors are things like telecommunications, pay banking, media, we're, we're here today, you're regulated federally, um, uh, inter-provincial transportation, so trucking, rail, uh, air, boats, those kinds of things. Um, some of the green elevators, for example, um, ports, that kind of thing. And uh, also the public service. So it's you know quite a large number of folks, but so it's So those not are all federally regulated? Those are all federally regulated sectors. And the rest of them are pretty much provincial? Yeah, so anything that's, you know, any kind of um, small businesses and services, often, uh, you know, restaurants, um, obviously the Ontario Public Service, those are all provincially regulated. And how does it break out by percentage? Is it like a 20-80 split or do you Oh, have it's a probably even smaller than that. I would say the majority of people are provincially regulated and you know, we have uh, a small percentage of, uh, of employees overall, but they're important employees. Uh, and we have an opportunity and an obligation, I think, at the federal government to show leadership, especially in a time where we see an attack on workers' rights. Uh, Hang on right there. We're gonna take a short break and we're gonna come right back to see how that federal provincial interplay is happening now. Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host Steve Mantis and my guest today is our local member of uh, Parliament, Federal Parliament, and she's also the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Labour. Welcome back Patty. Nice to be here. So we were just talking about, so you've got some legislation that's still in the works mm -hmm. on terms of labor standards. Is that right on yeah, the federal it's been, level? It's, it's been introduced to the House, so uh, you know we're hoping that it will pass as part of the Budget Implementation Act. We had talked about it over the last year or so, done the consultations with employers and union groups, and of course Canadians themselves. And um, it is about modernizing the Canada Labor Code. This was built on a report by a fellow named Harry Arthur's about almost 15 years ago now or so, he was commissioned by a previous Liberal government to say, what do we need to do to the Canada Labour Code to bring it up to standards and better protect people in the workforce and make sure that we have that sort of baseline. It really applies in the federally regulated sector to those who are most vulnerable. Many employees in the federally regulated sector are unionized, so they have collective agreements that are better than the Canada Labour Standards, mm -hmm. but this is about sort of those people that need it. Um, and Harry Authors delivered it uh, two years later to a Conservative government who did nothing with the report. As a matter of fact, I met Harry in Toronto and he tells a very good story of that day and how disappointing it was. And so when I was tasked by the Prime Minister to do this, I actually uh, called up Mr. Arthurs and asked if he would meet with me. So we met one morning in Toronto and he, uh, he talked about 
the work that he had done and what he would suggest that we do to sort of even take it a step further to deal with some of the precariousness that he saw had evolved since the time of his report. So Well, it's, it's interesting how our <clears throat> the, the lines cross. Harry Arthurs did a big review of WSIB and their funding back uh, eight years ago. Okay. And interesting, the government really didn't follow his advice any either. It's got to be disappointing to be a researcher who does <laughs> a lot know. of reports. So every researcher's worst nightmare that a report sits on a shelf, right? Uh, he was the dean of uh, Osgoode Hall for uh, law school for, uh, for a number of years. Mm. Okay, so you talked about earlier in the last segment that you've got things like sick days that people are entitled to right. and the issues around scheduling. Now, we had a lot of those same things in place here in Ontario a couple year and a half ago it came in. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like that's going to be taken away. How, how does this interplay work between the federal sector and the provincial sector? Well, obviously, as a federal government, we can't control what provinces do in terms of their own jurisdiction. And so they're able to, contro to control their own Ontario Labour Code, for example, or, you know, their own situations around various benefits that are distributed through the province. But again, I think we have an obligation to show leadership and I think it's really short-sighted of provinces to not understand that taking care of the most vulnerable in the workplace isn't just good for citizens that are, uh, you know, oftentimes in precarious work, but it's good for companies and it's good for our economy. You know, um, the data clearly shows that when people are attached to their employer, when they feel that security, when they feel that they have an employer that's going to, uh, you know, treat them fairly and with respect, uh, that they actually are more productive, they stay longer with those employees, employers. And what employers tell me is the cost of recruitment and retraining and all of the kinds of expenses that go with a constantly turning over workforce is really, really expensive. And it can be really hard for businesses in terms of productivity, but even in terms of health and safety. You know, retraining constantly, and I've been an employer, you know, Steve, at the shelter house, that is one of the most uh, expensive and burdensome things for employers. And you're, you know, you, it takes a while for an employee to become proficient in your sector or in your company. So smart employers are already doing this, and they're doing it because there's a good economic argument for it. So it's, it's unfortunate to see um, the Ford government taking aim at the most vulnerable vulnerable employees in, in, uh, in the province. Well, well, the whole kind of look at employment these days, I know in my lifetime, seems to be changing. Uh, workers are seen to be seen as just another piece of production that oftentimes we don't need to pay any attention to. Uh, we're looking at more jobs that are de-skilled and, and um, it, it feels like the value of workers, even though people say they're our most valuable piece of our company, um, they're played with in terms of the stock market and, and corporate decision making. And, and the vision of an employee, a worker, as really a partner in the business, and that if the business does well, we all do well together, kind of seems to be disappearing a little bit. What about that discourse and, and how, how, how does the federal government show leadership that, that says, look, mm -hmm. we need to think about it more than just a job, that it influences your health, your quality of life, your family, the chances for your kids, all those things are intertwined with our employment. Well, I think a couple things. One is, uh, as I said, we show leadership on things like ensuring that if a company isn't going to take those responsibilities seriously, that we set a, a decent floor mm -hmm. uh, for labor standards so that employers are, um, you know, obligated to ensure that someone, if they're sick, doesn't have to be put in a position of deciding to come to work and infect their colleagues, uh, also not get better, mm -hmm. uh, or stay home and lose a day of pay. That's an untenable position for anybody. Yeah. And those are decisions that people shouldn't have to make. So we can Especially help. Especially low income people that need that, that that every single day of work they can get. Right. We can highlight employers that have good practices that are doing this voluntarily because they've connected the dots. And many mm -hmm. employers and larger employers with a active unionization, for example, have collective agreements, as I said, that they've negotiated with workers that far exceed the Canada Labour Code. And that actually is a good protection as well. You know, making sure that a, a union environment thrives and that more Canadians understand the benefit of unionization, I think is a big important part of the work that I do as the Minister of Labour as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think thirdly, uh, I think the market is going to help. The tightening labor market is changing the conversation even since I've been the Minister of Employment. In the last three years, we've seen 
well over a half a million jobs added to the economy by employers. We've seen the lowest now, we've got the lowest rates of unemployment in our history since the 70s, since we started sort of calculating these things. And the conversation is shifting everywhere I go. Now it's about how do I, how, not just how do I find talent, but how do I keep the talent? And you know, when employers are asking themselves about how they keep the talent that they've managed to find, I think one of the answers is, how can you be the most competitive employer out there? You know, what are your salaries? What kinds of benefits do you offer your workers? How do your workers feel attached to your company? And I think maybe some companies are going to have to ask themselves those questions if they're not already. Now, that's not to say that a, a large number of employers aren't already doing that, but I think it is going to put the pressure on employers to be competitive, to say, we've found this talent. It is actually kind of rare. As the market tightens up, just like anything else, it becomes more and more valuable. And so how do we keep that investment that we've made in John, who we just hired last me month? We want to keep John on. Mm -hmm. And I think those conversations are important too. So I don't think there's any one single answer. I think the last thing is that whenever, as a Minister of Employment, we're providing opportunities for employers for student paid or for um, you know subsidized co-ops for example for young people or uh, youth employment opportunities that often have an employer subsidy what we've done is to try and incent employers to look deeper into un pockets of people that don't typically have an opportunity in the same way that other Canadians do whether that's um, people with disabilities, newcomers, indigenous people, uh, women in certain sectors and so we provide additional incentives to employers to say look uh, you know, w if you go out and find someone with a disability, uh, we'll give you an additional incentive so that you can actually start to see how that might fit within your own corporation. And what we're hearing back from employers is that um, once they start doing that, they start to realize the barriers that, that existed in their corporation and how they can move to eliminate those barriers and what a value it is to have a diverse workforce. So um, we're just about out of time from this segment, but. I'd like to just explore a little bit when we come back. What is the outlook for employment? There's a lot of different speculation whether we're going to lose jobs because everybody's going to, the jobs will be done by robots or what. But uh, we want to hear a little bit about that when we come back and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is our MP for Thunder Bay Superior North and the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Labor. Patty, welcome back. Nice to be here. So here you are, you're the Minister of Workforce Development, Labor, Employment. What's it look like in the future? On the one hand, we, I hear some people say, we need to increase the number of immigrants to fill the jobs that are gonna be there. And other people say, geez, we're not gonna have jobs because technology's gonna change everything and, and do it for us. What are your staff telling you, or, 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 or what's your view? What, mm -hmm. what does the labor market look like 5, 10, 20 years down the road? So it's an interesting question, because of course you're right, there's a whole bunch of speculation and there's a whole bunch of different kinds of um, perspectives. What I would say is that I'm a tech optimist. I am not in the robots are coming and stealing everybody's job camp at all. I think the way that we think about education, skills training, and better integrating what the needs of employers are today with what we're actually teaching young people from even kindergarten to grade 12, but then beyond and post-secondary, um, ensuring that older workers or workers that have been out of school for a long time have an opportunity to reskill. All of that's going to be important because I think that what the skill set that people need is, is dramatically different. And yet, also somewhat the same. When I talk to employers all across the country, what they're saying is, um, obviously there's a new emphasis on science and math. And so, you know, we try to have these conversations with um, younger parents of younger children, but also through the, the measures that we have at the federal level to really emphasize um, science, engineering, technology, mathematical skills. Uh, I think they're going to be in, in critical and no matter what job. Think about the skilled trades. It used to be that people thought you could go into skilled trades with relatively little math acumen. That is no longer true. I mean, you need to be able to do, um, you know, all kinds of different calculations, whether it's reading blueprints or, you know, algebra or figuring out a GPS system, uh, how to program, how to code in some cases equipment. All of that is now part of the skilled trade. So no matter what you do, uh, math is going to be a piece of it. I think the other thing, um, 
is the better integration between what's being te taught at academic institutions, colleges, universities, polytechnics, and what businesses need. And so we have a really exciting project right now I'll be announcing very soon, um, an investment in something called the Future Skills Center. This is a big investment of you know almost half a billion dollars over the next five or so years where uh, um, different organizations will work with researchers to figure out what we're teaching, how we're teaching it, and whether it's needing the needs of employers. And so there'll be an opportunity to do some research on the ground and, and pilot different kinds of ways of learning. It's all sort of technical and wonky, but it's going to give us a better sense of um, how we're integrating what people are learning with what the needs of employers are. And we're going to hopefully be able to accelerate that process. So I think for me, I'm a tech optimist. I think the world of work is dramatically changing. Here's one of the ways it's staying the same though. So many employers say to me, look, kids are coming out of university and college better skilled than they ever have, and yet they're missing in some of what we call soft skills. You know, uh, are they able to uh, problem solve? Are they able to get along with a difficult colleague? What do they do when there's a conflict situation in work? Um, do they have basic customer service skills? Do they know how to answer a phone in a professional setting? And you know what the answer is for employers is not always. And that's why things like uh, our work integrated learning program where we actually pay for paid co-ops while student is actually studying in that sector um, allows for the student to learn on the job, not just from the textbook, not just from a theoretical perspective, but they actually get integrated in their last year or two of school with employers in their sector. So they start to get that hands-on feeling of what it's like to work in that company or in that sector. And what employers have been saying is more please, because this is really working. Because they're able to take a student who has really great subject matter knowledge and then give them that additional sort of experience that leads to those soft skills. And so we're looking at ways that we can expand the work integrated learning in the budgets to come. So another area that's not on your portfolio directly is really including uh, Indigenous folks in the workforce. And, and I'm really thinking about folks that are starting off uh, um, in the First Nation communities, mm -hmm. many of them are remote in our area. And we know if people don't finish high school, their chance of getting a job, any kind of job, or certainly not a decent job, is very small. Um, What's the federal government, which has a certain level of responsibility in these communities, what are they doing to then bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. So my colleague Jane Philpott has been working diligently on more schools, more funding for students' education. She's working right now on the child welf welfare system and getting... Has funding gone up? What, what are we looking at? So funding has gone up overall in First Nations communities, and I don't have those numbers. Okay. I'd have to get back to you with those numbers or else... I'm a big numbers guy. Sure. <laughs> Had you asked me that before the interview, I would have come prepared for you, <laughs> but we can get you that information. Uh, funding has gone up overall, though, in terms of spending on Indigenous communities for all of those social determinants for housing, for water, for uh, education centers, for First Nations schooling. Um, again, w all with the focus that First Nations um, have the right and the ability to control their own destiny for their own communities. And so that, uh, that concept of self-determination is being woven into everything we do. And I can talk more clearly about something that I do have control of, which is the formerly named Aboriginal Skills Education Training Program, but it's now called Indigenous Skills Education Training Program to reflect uh, Métis in Northern Ontario or Northern uh, Canada. And this program, when it was introduced in 1999, did not receive an increase till we formed government in 2015. We sort of gave uh, an additional 50 million year, a year for both of the first two budgets. And last year I was able to secure a 57% increase overall for the program. Wow, that's a big number. Huge number, yeah. And uh, really, well received by and actually I, I, credit is to the chiefs of the country who uh, focused on this almost uh, relentlessly in terms of the way out for communities. Mm -hmm. This was the way um, that was going to actually provide them with the sufficient money and again the control to be able to deliver skills training in a way that was culturally and regionally appropriate and met the labor market needs of their region. And so not only are they getting more money, but there's a 10-year agreement that will be negotiated. They're in the process right now of negotiating these 10-year agreements and they will have control to deliver the program in a way that makes sense for their communities and their regions. Before, the program was very much into counting 
you know, how long the person stayed in the program and then did they get a job. But they didn't actually look at the quality of jobs. So mm -hmm. people were driving with less and less money, people to get through very quickly and maybe land as a gas station attendant. But su supposing that person wanted to be a nurse on the community, there was no additional money to get that person to that end state goal that they had where they wanted to maybe be a nurse or a teacher or a truck driver or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so now the communities will be able to shape that money and actually be able to work with individuals to actually decide what their labor market needs are and how they get people to those, those, uh, those good paying jobs. Patty, we're out of time. It is so great having you on the show and I uh, hope you come back again soon. Uh, we just have to find more time. Yes, thank you for having me. Please stay safe and we'll see you again next week.